unnecessary uh, lead up or intro, let me introduce the Arkansas senior senator, U.S. Senator Mark Pryor. Mark Pryor. Slip there, he's going to say senior citizen, not senior. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going to keep it very brief. Randy said, Look, just kind of tee it up for three or four minutes and then let's just jump into the questions. Is that okay, to everybody? Yeah. We just do that. So, let me just say a few things very, very quickly. Um, first, I want to say thank you for having me here and thank you all for doing what you do. You guys are the business community, you're the foundation of the state, uh, you're the ones that are creating the jobs, making the investments, doing all the things that make Arkansas such a great place to do business and we're certainly proud of everything that y'all are doing and I think that one of the things that um, <clears throat> I wish some more of my Democratic colleagues in Washington would acknowledge uh, is that there's no better social program than a good job you know if we can get people jobs if we can create the right kind of of course Arkansas is a good business climate good place to work we all know that I'm going to Remington a little bit later I was in the bad boy mowers yesterday. I mean, you know, this is a great place to do business. If we could do more of that nationally, and one of the things that's been frustrating for me in Washington is you really see this, unfortunately, is a lot of people in Washington have kind of given up on American manufacturing. I think that's a huge, huge mistake. I think we need to focus on manufacturing. And also, especially if you consider the energy that we're now producing domestically, natural gas, oil, our domestic energy production has really gone up a lot, and that is making a big difference in economic opportunity here, uh, not just in Arkansas, but here in the U.S., and we need to capitalize on that. We need to understand that and understand that the game is changing and that we can do great things in this country and we can get back into manufacturing. I know we have a lot of manufacturing now, but we can get back and do even more and get some of these jobs to come back from overseas and when these companies are trying to find a place to go. They ought to be coming right here in the U.S. And certainly, Arkansas should be top of the list. So for a lot of reasons, even though you see a lot of gridlock in Washington, and a lot of that is creating uncertainty and there's all kinds of problems in Washington, I'm, I'm convinced that the hyper-partisanship in D.C. is causing a lot of the sluggishness in the economy because people are waiting for signals, they're waiting for the Congress and the administration and others to kind of get their act together and move forward and it's just been really hard sometimes because with all the gridlock you know you just kind of stuck in neutral everybody's revving their engine and nobody's going anywhere so even with all that said I think we have lots of reasons to be optimistic about our country about our future and I think we need to uh, embrace that and move forward you can look at the economic data right now y'all seen this y'all watch this closer than anybody you look at our activity in factories, it's, it's growing at the fastest pace in, in two years. Trade gap, even though it's bad, we want it to be better, is actually improving. Exports are actually improving, and that's a good thing. That's good for Arkansas. We do a lot of exports here. Home sales getting better. It, it was great news. Didn't get nearly as much publicity as I thought it would, but great news that Moody's not long ago put us back at the AAA rating. I think that's important. That's important as we go forward. And Randy knows this because he's he lives this every day, and a lot of the rest of you do as well. We've had a lot of good jobs announcements here in Arkansas, and I know we've had some losses. We get that. The economy changes. We understand that. We look at certain areas and we see some of the, the the losses, and that's just part of being in a you know capitalist economy and this global economy that we're in. But nonetheless, you know you look at a thousand new jobs with Serco, 150 new jobs with Fidelity, 200 jobs with Sites Call Center in Alma, 100 jobs with Mercy Hospital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, good things are happening in the state, and we need to embrace that. Now, I think, again, Arkansas has got a good business climate. We need to promote that. You guys do a great job promoting that. You all do it every day, and that's great. Let me just say two or three things about Washington. First, um, debt and deficit continue to be a huge problem, and um, I've been leading the charge in a lot of ways on trying to be smart about how we address this. Some of this is pretty small in terms of like cutting travel budgets and things like that, but the truth is there's a lot of wasted money, a lot of wasted resources in the government. We have a situation now where uh, the federal government owns 77,000 buildings 
77,000 buildings that they've done these studies and they think that we can get rid of those buildings they are not used at all or they're underused. And you know, we're, we're every month, we're, we're mowing the grass there, we're fixing the roofs, we're paying the light bill. You know, we need to, in a smart way, get those off of our books, get them out to the private sector, let people develop that, whatever. Um, and you all know, some of these are, are incredible opportunities. Some aren't worth very much, and who knows what we'll do with them. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there won't be a lot of market for some of it. But nonetheless, you know, we need to be smart about that and find ways to, to do the right kind of cuts. And I guess I would say, given the economic situation we've been through, and given the fiscal situation of the federal government, you know, these are tough times. And tough times require tough decisions. We need to be willing to make those tough decisions. You have folks in Washington who are willing to stick their neck out politically to do the right thing. I think that's the kind of senator I've always tried to be. And I think <coughs> when I'm traveling around the state of Arkansas and, you know, wherever I happen to be, I've been in several counties the last couple of days, but wherever I happen to be, people come up to me and they're very frustrated with Washington. And you know what? They ought to be. There's a lot of good reasons to be frustrated with Washington. We get that. I get that. But what I hear over and over is they're not frustrated with me because they see me as different, someone who's trying to be a problem solver, be a bridge builder, try to help, try to tune out all the red versus blue, all the rhetoric, all the press conferences, all the talking points, and someone who's really trying to, uh, you know, make a difference and, and bring people together and find good solutions. And no matter how big or how small, let's get in here and work on these things and let's get through it. So, I mentioned debt and deficit. Let me talk about uh, jobs and the economy. I think one thing that we can do to really help business in this country and to make the U.S. generally a more attractive place to do business <clears throat> is regulation reform. And I'm working with Senator Portman, and some of y'all know this, we have the Portman Prior Reg Reform Bill. And what, what this does, this doesn't go after EPA or it doesn't go after, you know, the Department of Commerce or whatever. This, what this does is it changes the way we regulate it, modernizes the way we regulate it. I think it's it's overdue. We have, uh, you know, the uh, the, um, the the underlying regulatory law has been on the books for 50, 60 years. It's time to modernize that. We need to make that a 21st century thing. So one thing I'd like to do is get the stakeholders in earlier in the process to hear from them. We also need to do things like make sure that the agency actually has the legal authority to do the regulation because we find that that's not always the case. But nonetheless, get the stakeholders in earlier and then uh, require the agency to do a cost-benefit analysis. And, you know, hopefully through that process, they'll understand how much this really costs and what it really does. And then at the end of the process, require them to choose the least costly option to get done what they want to do. And we've all seen this, where we see this regulation that really doesn't make a lot of sense out in the real world. So what we're trying to do, in effect, with Portman Pryor, is we're trying to do regulation smarter, cheaper, faster, right? But we're trying to go smarter reg earlier. We, we, we filed this bill a year or so ago, year and a half, probably, well, probably two years ago now, we filed it. The American Bar Association got it, and what I'd say, they chewed it to pieces. But actually, they made a lot of constructive suggestions. We've had a lot of input from industries and all that, and think tanks around the country. And the new bill, I think, is much stronger, much better. And I'm hoping that we're able to move it through the Senate this year and hopefully get it on over the finish line. And Rob Portman, who's a Republican from Ohio, has been a great, great um, partner on that. I also think, and I want to open the questions in just a minute, but I do think we need to continue to invest in infrastructure. I think it's critical. We had the highway department in my office the other day. We were talking about the 430, 630 interchange and all those orange bar barrels. You know, you can thank me for some of that because I was able to get some of the money at critical points. And I know it's a dirty word with some people, but some of that was earmark money. And I'm, I'm not opposed to earmarks. Uh, when they're good for Arkansas, when we do all the things we're supposed to do with earmarks, we make them more transparent and you know, understand that the American public can see what's going on and why. Anyway, we can talk about that more if you want to. But I'm a big believer in investing in infrastructure and that includes in Arkansas, something that's critically important to me is rural broadband. We have to continue to invest in rural broadband. 
I was in Sharp County yesterday. And they struggle up there with cell phone coverage. They only have one cable system in the whole county, I think is what they told me. I'll, I'll double check that. But, you know, satellite TV is critical. They can't get Little Rock stations. I mean, you know, lots of things. We, we're going to work on that. I told them yesterday, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee that does that in the Senate. So we're going to work on that. And I think that we're going to have a good solution. It's going to take us a little while to get there, but hopefully we're going to reauthorize the satellite <coughs> TV bill next year. We have to by law. And so we're going to try to make sure that uh, communities, communities in Sharp County, but those little isolated communities all over the country are taken care of. So we'll, we'll, we'll work through that as we get through it. But nonetheless, um, we need to invest in infrastructure. It's critical. We can talk a lot about that. But one thing that I'm a huge, huge booster of is your new technology part here in Little Rock. I think it's critical. I think that I'm not going to get involved in where it's going to be located. I know that's the big fight right now. There's, there's good people working on that. Y'all we'll, can figure that out. But man, we need that to happen and we need it sooner rather than later because you have all the elements here in Central Arkansas to bring together to really make that, it's, it, that thing over time is going to create thousands and thousands of jobs here in Central Arkansas. It's huge. And um, anyway, we, we need to do that. We need to try to get that over the finish line. Uh, and again, I know a lot of people in this room and around this area, this community are working on it and for lots of good reasons. So I hope that we can do that because we need to get that underway because there's going to be lots and lots of opportunity to come through Y'all call it the, the technology part? What is the technology part? You know, look, let's come together, let's reason together, let's get this thing done. The truth is, um, we just went back to the AAA rating. We do not need to jeopardize that again. But we also need to make sure that we are getting ourselves back on sound fiscal footing. I'm not happy with where we are there. I think we missed a great opportunity with Simpson Bowles. I don't agree with everything in Simpson Bowles or things I've changed, but still, I think what the Simpson Bowles Debt Commission did is it laid out the, the blueprint for what we need to do to get our debt deficit under control and get back to where we can manage this thing and hopefully get it behind us. It's gonna take some time, but I think right now, you know, here again, there's kind of a, what I would say is kind of an artificial crisis being created in Washington because of the hyper-partisanship. Reasonable people, we can sit in this room, reasonable minds can maybe disagree on this, but we can also come to an agreement on what it ought to look like. And, you know, I hear people say, well, the deficit is falling. It is. Look, we went from a trillion dollar annual deficit to 500 and something billion this time, but 500 and something billion is still way too much. I mean, come on, it's, it's not sustainable. We need to drive that down. One of the things about Bill Clinton, you know, when he actually balanced the budget, and he had a balanced budget for the last four years he was around, one of the things about him, one of the keys to this, was he had a strong economy. And, and part of this is if we can get the economy going again and really get it firing on all cylinders, that'll help a lot. It doesn't fix everything, but it does help a lot. And we, yeah, I guess the last thing I'd say on this, Randy, is uh, back in 2011, we passed the Budget Control Act. And everybody needs to understand this. This doesn't get a lot of national press, but we need to understand this. We passed the national the, the Budget Control Act of 2011. And when we did that, what we did is we put hard spending caps on the federal government. So just like back, you know, 25 years ago when they were doing it with um, some of the other legislation way back in the day, we have hard spending caps now. That's one reason why, or that is the reason why, we have the sequester. And we hear about the sequestration and sequester. All that is all tied back to the Budget Control Act of 2011. A program like that, that's in discretionary spending. That's, that's called discretionary spending, because we don't have to do that, but it's discretionary. And what's happening is the budget squeeze is really coming hard on those discretionary programs. I think you can measure, there's no doubt, that those programs have been amazingly successful, and they're huge job creators and the <laughs> ripple effect in the economy. I mean, I'd have to look at the numbers, but per dollar you put in, you're rippling probably 10 times, 20 times that much through the economy. I mean, they work. Um, so don't cut off your nose to spite your face here. Let's be smart about how we do this. This is an example is if you just go cut, 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 you're, you're, not, you're not governing wisely. If you can take a program like that and say, hey, we need to enhance that program and maybe cut some of this other stuff completely eliminate it, but let's enhance that because it's really working. Let me tell you a quick story. Um, 
But anyway, the bottom line is we're going to, I'm going to try to help get more funding. It's hard in this budget environment. What I tell folks from Arkansas, when they come to see me in Washington or when I meet with them here, I just kind of say, let's start with the premise that everybody gets a cut. Because that's kind of where we are. That's the budget environment we're in. Everybody gets a cut. Francis Collins was telling us the other day that when they started the Human, human Genome Project, it, it cost three billion dollars it took 13 years to map the human genome okay three billion dollars 13 years to map the human genome now there's a company that makes this this little microchip and i could use this microchip on you and if i could map your genome for three thousand dollars in three days okay that's what, that's, what, that's what government investment can do. It, it kicked the door down on genetics. It cracked the code. And what it's going to do is let, let people, whoever they are, innovate and create. And they say this company now is trying to get this product down to where it's a thousand bucks and they can do it three or four hours. Okay? That means you go into UAMS, you have cancer. They can, I don't know how they do it, but they figure out they take some genes out of you. They, run this thing through, the, run what you got through the system. They can look at your markers, they can do all this stuff. Again, you have to get some UAMS people in here to tell us how it works. But they can design your treatment that's going to work absolutely for you. It's going to be personalized. It's amazing. It's totally transformative. But because of that federal investment, those are your tax dollars. As a nation, we decided we're going to map the human genome so that things like this one day would be possible. And it won't be long before something like this gets to UAMS or gets to St. Vincent or gets to, you know, Northwest <coughs> Arkansas Hospital or whatever, and, it, and it's going to make a huge difference all over the state of Arkansas, all over the country, all over the world. Once again, the U.S. is going to lead the world. So we need to keep that competitive advantage. Who else has a question? Yes, sir. What's the possibility of immigration reform? Well, the Senate has done a talk on immigration reform, and I know I won't, I hadn't heard the end of it. I know during this campaign I'll get a lot of criticism about immigration reform and my vote on it but the truth is we all know that our immigration system is broken and the senate when you get you know, eight senators four republicans four democrats come together they're the architects of this bill let me tell you for anybody who's worried about it this is the toughest border security bill the united states has ever passed no doubt there's not even a close second this is the toughest border security bill the u.s Senate has ever passed i'm hoping the house will take it up they have a lot of heartburn about it. Um, they're saying some, at least, are saying publicly, they won't. It won't come up. It's dead on arrival, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know that bill got 70 some odd votes. I can't remember the number. 73, 78 votes in the Senate. It was a very bipartisan bill. Um, everybody worked hard to get there. Maybe, maybe, maybe we got 68 votes. I don't remember exactly what it got, but it got well over 60 votes in the Senate, somewhere around the time. And. Um, I think that's the right policy. It's border security first, and then it's to try to fix the other things in the system. Uh, I know that the state chamber has been very vocal. Randy's been very vocal, and lots of people in this room have been vocal about it. Um, so I would, you know, hope that as we go forward, that the U.S. House will take it up and it'll go to conference. We'll get it passed this year. But it's hard to say right now what the House will do. It. I think they're, I think they're very torn on it. I think they have a very vocal probably a majority of Republicans in the House that don't want it to come up. And they have this rule over there, the majority of the majority rule. And unless um, the Speaker figures out a way to get around that, you may not be able to bring it up. But anyway, hopefully they'll do it. I think it's good for the country. It's good for Arkansas. We've had businesses all over the state. The business community in Arkansas, basically I haven't heard much negative from the business community on it. Farmers, you name it. They want this to happen. And again, Randy's been uh, leading the charge, and that, that's a tough position to take because it's, it's, it's emotional and it's hard and, you know, you guys have stuck your neck out uh, so to be clear uh, that you're for it. I appreciate that. And uh, like I said, I, I know I won't hear the last of it. I hadn't heard the last of it yet. Uh, for this who, who else has a question? Yes, sir. What's the chance of SGR something happening? That SGR is the, what's that stand for again? The it's the doc fix. Yeah, I know it's the it, doc fix, but the, it's it's um <laughs> we talk about it all the time. I just can't remember the acronym right now. But anyway, it's, the, it's, it's, what, it's what we call the the doc 
fix. That's a nickname of it in um, in Washington. But anyway, it, it has to do with Medicare reimbursement, and it's how much we reimburse our, our health care providers under Medicare. The problem is that years and years ago, when they set those rates, they did not index them for inflation. So, you know, the first few years, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, you, if you're a doctor, hospital, whatever, that's, that's doing a lot of Medicare uh, patients, taking a lot of Medicare patients, you know, yeah, you're losing a little ground, but there gets a point where you basically can't afford to do Medicare patients anymore. You, you know, just economically, you just can't keep the doors open by doing that. So, what we need to do in Washington is we need to do a permanent, once and for all, doc fix. I mean, that's what we need to do. And to me, this falls under the category of honesty and budgeting. Okay, we're going to fix it every year, but but again, Congress has gotten into this terrible habit of not wanting to kick the can down the road. This is a classic case. Congress doesn't want to stand up and say, and even the, the president doesn't want to do this. It's not all Congress, but Congress does not want to stand up and say, okay, we're going to fix this once and for all. Even though it looks bad in the budget, we're going to fix it. Let's just be honest. We're going to fix it every year, so let's just fix it permanently. Let's take all the drama out of this. Let's take the uncertainty out of this. We have doctors every year. There's been times when we just fix it a few months at a time, you know. But we have doctors every year call our office or meet with us, or when I'm traveling the state, I saw some doctors yesterday. They didn't actually mention this yesterday. That's kind of rare. But, um, but anyway, we have people all the time say, look, if y'all don't fix this, I just can't see Medicare patients anymore or I can't take any new patients. That's probably what we hear most of all. Can't take any new patients. So we need to fix it once and for all. It, it's not hard to do mathematically, it's just hard to do politically because people don't want to admit that it does you know, hurt the budget numbers. But you know, honestly, let's just do it. it to me, it's like the uh, alternative minimum tax, the AMT. We're gonna extend that every year. Let's just admit it on the front end. Let's just be honest with people and say we're gonna do it. And I know it doesn't make the budget numbers any better, it makes them worse, but let's just be honest about it. Let's have some truth in budgeting here. Let's just lay it out and fix it. Well, that's where I am. That's the way I voted. That's what I support. And, you know, I may be in a minority up there, but I think we're going to fix it. Domestic energy is very important for lots of different reasons. It really is a national security issue, but it's a huge jobs issue as well. I mean, we have this resource, and as says, now we have the technology. Let's develop them, let's use them, let's, let's lessen our dependence on foreign oil and, and you know, let's, especially the Mideast stuff. I mean, I, I'm okay with the pipeline, the Keystone Pipeline. I've been for that <clears throat> since day one, even after the Mayflower spill, and I'm not real happy with Exxon on some of that, but nonetheless, we can talk about that later, but even after the Mayflower <laughs> spill, I think pipelines are the right policy. That's the cheapest way to transport it. It's the safest way to transport it. And it allows us to bring oil in from Canada, like the friendliest uh, neighbor, the, the friendliest ally we have. I mean, you know, it allows us to bring it in from them. And for every gallon we get from them, we're not getting it out of the Mideast. Um, it helps jobs here, of course, you know, doesn't hurt the fact that we're, you know, building the pipeline here, but, you know, making the pipeline itself here. But nonetheless, it's good for the economy. It's good for the country. It helps our trade deficit on and on and on. That's one of the reasons our trade deficit is going down is because we are using more domestic energy. Instead of just importing whatever it was, 60% of our energy from OPEC, whatever the number used to be, that number's going way down if you look at the numbers. So anyway, it's a good thing to have good domestic supply of energy for, for lots of different reasons. All right, now I'm, I'm just going to ask a question on this side right now. We're not gonna, yeah, that, that's part of what we're trying to do here. We want to make Sure. One, the first, one of the probably the, the first requirement we put in Portland prior is that they have to state specifically what statutory authority they have to do this regulation. And see, right now they don't do that. Some agencies are better than others. But what well, y'all know this, if y'all have to deal with some of the agencies, sometimes they'll get they'll get the regulation. They'll go all the way through the process. And then it's challenging court, and they say, "Oh, y'all didn't even have this authority in the first place." We're trying. To, that's when I, when we say faster, better, cheaper, faster. That's what we mean. If you get it right on the front end, and you get and the other thing about regulation, by the way, and you, you see this a lot, is that a lot of times the the stakeholders, the folks at impact, y'all see this, where um, 
they, they really don't have any idea, for example, with EPA, they have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what the motive is on this regulation. They, I mean, the people out here, the business community, they have no idea. And all of a sudden, bam, uh, EPA will pop out the uh, proposed reg. And you're like, whoa, 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 this is all wrong. The whole premise of this is wrong. This doesn't make economic sense. What, you know, we feel like if the stakeholders have a voice earlier in the process, it will help shape in a very constructive way the, regu the regulation so it starts in a better place, and then you can implement it in a better way. So, uh, again, I want to really thank Senator Portman for his leadership on this. He is tireless on this issue, and I'm glad that I'm his partner. You know, we, we this is truly a, a partnership, and um, it's been it's been great. And we're going to try to push this and try to get this uh, through. I'm on. We're on the. Uh, I'm on the. Homeland Security Committee, and that's where we go because what we're doing is we're the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee basically has the old tradition, just a general oversight of the federal government, and so the um, Administrative Procedures Act, they call the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, we have jurisdiction over that. So when it comes to changes, we'll do that. So we're not going specifically after EPA, but what we would do would apply to every agency. That's our point. Do us a question. I mean, it's like yours better than it used to be. And we have the technology now. We can do things with coal that we couldn't do before. It is more expensive to have a, a really a cleaner coal-fired plant. But you know what? Um, we can do it. And hopefully that cost will go down over time. We hope as, as more and more of this comes on. But one of the reasons why we should, as a nation, not give up on coal is because the U.S. is, we're like the Saudi Arabia of coal. We have like 400 years worth of coal supply. Yeah. We shouldn't give up on that. We should work on technology, make it cleaner. You look at, for example, Arkansas Electric Co-ops, they rely heavily on coal, but a lot of people all over the country rely heavily on coal. It's a huge asset we have. Again, all domestic energy, all U.S. jobs. We can burn it, we can do it cleaner than we've ever been able to do it. And again, I saw Carmi and Henry walk in a minute ago. It, it's, it is more expensive to do that, but still, we can do it, and we should do it. So, so I'm in a different place than the administration. I think that uh, I'm very comfortable with coal, just like I'm comfortable with oil and natural gas. Uh, I, when people say, and by the way, I'm comfortable with nuclear. I'm a, I'm a nuclear proponent as well. When people say all of the above when it comes to energy, I mean it. I mean, all of the above. We need to, if we can find alternative energy, let's do it. If we can develop solar, amen, brother. You know, if we can do wind, I'm, I, let's, let's get it. But all, really, if you look at our all of our energy needs, we really do need all of the above. But they're, 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 all of those things bring certain good things to the table, uh, to the energy equation. Let, let's capitalize, let's, let's utilize all the, all the positives we have, and, and let's do that. So, so I, I'm I'm fine with coal. Um, I think we need to, you know, make sure we utilize the asset. Let's do it in a very smart way. If the House of Representatives has a way, you're going to get quick quick email at your house, okay? Because that's what they are working on in the House Committee, and it's astounding. I can't believe it. The, the U.S. Post Office is in the Constitution. That's one thing that the Founding Fathers told us to do, is set up a postal system, postal roads, et cetera. It's in the Constitution. Um, here's the answer. The Senate has, we passed postal reform last year, and on specifically on Saturday delivery, what we said is you can only consider Saturday, uh, what we call five-day delivery. You can only consider five-day delivery if X, Y, and Z are met. So once you exhaust all your other possibilities, if you have to and you have to do it basically to save the postal system, then we authorize them to make that decision. But it really is, uh, we put it in a last resort category. Um, the, the problem is, and this has been a huge uh, problem I've had with the Postmaster General, is they are not forthcoming on their numbers. They, they're not forthcoming on their analysis. They won't tell us how much this actually saves. And the reason they won't, I believe, is it really doesn't save that much money. It's really not that much more expensive. If you're running five days a week, just run that extra day, they've got the workforce. You know, one thing, and they deserve a lot of credit for this. People don't appreciate this. We don't hear this a lot. But the Postal Service has become incredibly more efficient than they were, say, 20 years ago. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the number of employees, and, and the consolidation has been painful, but if you look at the number of employees and how they do things, um, they've been 
uh, they've, they've tried very, very hard to find the efficiencies. And here's one more thing about that, Anne, and, and you know, we just need to understand this. Um, sometimes in Washington, I think people inside the Beltway completely lose sight of this. The Postal Service is necessary for this country for lots of different reasons. But one of the things you hear in Washington is they say, well, you know, UPS can do it cheaper, FedEx can do it cheaper. Let me tell you something. UPS and FedEx are not want, willing to let you pay 40 something cents and deliver a letter from here to Bangor, Maine in three or four days. They're not going to do that. They'll, they'll, they'll deliver it in a couple of days for 10 or $15, but they're not going to do it for 40 something cents. That's not their business model. What they've done is, and with all, I, I love FedEx and UPS, and they're great companies. But what they've been able to do is they've gone into parcel and, and the overnight stuff, and those are the most lucrative areas of, of delivery, right? And so that's where they are, and they're doing that, and they're great. But here's the last thing you need to know, is as great as UPS and FedEx are, and as great a job as they do, in rural America, guess who delivers the last mile, so-called last mile, for FedEx and UPS? It's the U.S. Postal Service. You, you live in Ashflat, Arkansas, you don't have a FedEx truck driving to your house. you got the mailman delivering you a FedEx package. They're the last mile. And uh, anyway, what we need to keep the Postal Service. I think the Senate Postal Reform Bill that we passed last year is a good bill. I just read a couple of days ago that we're going to try to get that out of our committee again right when we get back. I hope that's the case. We've had some problems uh, in, inside the committee on trying to get it through, but hopefully we have that resolved. We're going to try to get that back. Hopefully, get it through the committee quickly, get it through the Senate floor quickly, get it over the House, and um, hopefully, we'll get the right post reform mm -hmm. need. And by the way, last thing on postal service, they need to reform. I mean, think about the transition that they're having to deal with. Think about email. I mean, you know, think about how few letters you actually write anymore. Um, now, when you, you know, when you're a utility customer, you, your utility, your bank, et cetera, et cetera, they want you to do things electronically, and, and that's great. You know, debit cards, it used to be that every day at Kroger, they probably had a stack of checks this tall, you know, every day. And they, those had to at some point go through the mail, somehow, some way to get processed. Well, now, you know, people don't write checks nearly like what they used to. People use debit cards, you know, and all that. So anyway, there's been a huge, huge technology revolution and, you know, the Postal Service is having to adjust to that, but we still need the Postal Service to be department. A few years ago, that doesn't make sense in how they want to do it, so we're, we're working on all that. And that's a work in progress. I don't have any uh, breaking news to report on that, but we are working on it. It's a, it's a, it's a top priority. Why? <laughs> that's always going to be my question. Yeah, that's good. Well, that's a great question to have. Yes, sir. Um, going back to the post office, isn't there an issue with them having to pre-fund their retirement yes. program for like billions of dollars? And I'd also uh, like to ask you what the status of the farm bill is okay, right now. Great. All right. Uh, on the Postal Service, yes. The Congress years ago, I wasn't in the Congress then, but Congress years ago uh, required the Postal Service to pre-fund uh, retiree health benefits and a couple other things. And basically, the, the formulas are wrong. They are overfunding that. You, they can save billions of dollars just literally by a stroke of the pen if we will allow them to get out from under those obligations. They don't need those obligations. The other thing that they're trying to do, and we're trying to encourage them to do, is do a lot of early retirements. And things. There's a lot of efficiencies they can do right now that they're limited from, on doing because the way the law is structured. So we're trying to basically you know, let them do some of these things that, that, that corporate America would do in a heartbeat, but they just can't do it because they're constricted by law. So we are trying to fix that. That's a big part of the post reform in the Senate. Uh, farm bill. Agriculture is our largest industry in the state of Arkansas. Uh, I am very disappointed with where we are on the farm bill in Washington. The Senate passed a big comprehensive bipartisan bill. Um, our bill went over to the House. Um, uh, they, they had their own bill, but it, it really mirrored. It's like a companion bill to our bill. Uh, I'm trying to put this delicately. Uh, three of our four House members voted to um, uh, do the comprehensive bill and voted to keep it going and move forward. One of our House delegation, who has to be running for the United States Senate right now, he, he voted against that. He voted to, to break up 
the, the commodities title, from the nutrition title. For a lot of different reasons, that's bad policy and it's also bad politics because um, in the way we, the Congress has put this bill together this way for 50 plus years. And the reason you do is, in my world, when, when you put nutrition and all the other farm stuff together, it's about counting votes. And we need urban congressmen and senators to support the legislation. But also, besides that, it makes very good policy sense to do it because these nutrition programs, things like school lunch program, Meals on Wheels, food stamps called SNAP, uh, these things, remember, they, they use virtually 100% U.S. agriculture products when they do this. So anyway, it creates a market for our farmers. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's, it's just good all the way around to keep them together. So unfortunately, what's happened uh, now is the House, and, and again, three of our four House members basically acknowledge this, they passed something that's unpassable in the Senate. The, the, the Farm Bill Without Nutrition, I think, just will not work in the Senate. So they're going to hopefully go to conference, and hopefully they'll be able to iron this out. I don't know how it works, but the problem is that agriculture is our very top uh, industry in Arkansas, but the truth is, if you look at the U.S. economy, um, agriculture may not be the sexiest, most exciting thing in the world, but it is a core strength of the U.S. economy. It is something we do better than anybody else in the world. Everybody wants to be like us, literally. The innovation happens here, the new farm practices happen here. You know, so many innovations happen here in the U.S. We're the world leader. And why in the world do we want to fool around with this and start chopping this up and doing this differently? I'll, I'll never understand the, under, the, the reasons for that. But I'm very concerned with where we are. There's no guarantee we pass the Farm Bill this year. The last thing you want to do is revert back to the 1949 law. It just will call, you're talking about creating uncertainty. I mean, it will be havoc and it'll it'd be huge. So hopefully we can get this resolved, but we don't have much time. We basically have from now to the end of September. And so we're on a very tight deadline to try to get this fixed. Yeah, we, we don't need to do that. This is a, talking about the Federal Highway Bill, this is a, an important uh, infrastructure bill that we need to do. Um, I don't really base my decision making on polls, but even when you look at the polls, you see that investing in infrastructure is still a popular uh, bit of government spending. People in our country understand why infrastructure is so important. It is federal spending. I mean, we all know that and we're trying to hide that. But it also really is an investment in the future. Because not only are you creating jobs right now, you look like 436 30 interchange, just for example. Not only is that creating jobs right now, obviously that's, that, you know, you look at, you, I asked the highway department the other day, I said, is every single ounce of product going into the 436 30 interchange, is it all American made? And he said, well, I can't tell you that the bolts that go in there are American-made, but just about everything else in that project, the sand, the gravel, probably all the steel, maybe not every single bit of it, but on and on and on, all those workers, you know, all that stuff that's going on, it's, it's American-made. And it's good for our economy. It does have this stimulative effect, this ripple effect, but even more important than the immediate, which is, you know, a year or two or three of construction, that's one thing, and that's great. But long term, that's where you get the return on investment. You know, that's where it really happens. Think about the interstate highway system that was built in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and kind of phase in over time. But think about that and think about all the investment. Every person who's done has done economic development at one time or another. Kind of the cardinal rule is you have to be on an interstate. I mean, they tell us that over. It's very rare when a company says, ah, we don't care for it. I mean, you get those every now and then, but basically, almost everybody you talk to, we have to be on an interstate. And that's the investment, that's the opportunity that, that highway bills do. I'm a big supporter of highway bills. I think we ought to do it. I'm hoping we're able to get to one this year or next year. And I hope it will be big. And by the way, I've talked right before Ray LaHood left. He came in, I talked to him about trying to get I-49 and I-69 built, I'm trying to figure out mathematically, how do we do that? Um, even though he left, a lot of his people or the people that were there, they've stayed. I had a subsequent meeting with them to talk about 49, 69. How do we do that? How do we finish these two 
great um, interstate highways. They've been on the books for a long time. We're, uh, this isn't parochial. We're not making this up. You look on a map of the U.S. interstate highway system, and there's a couple of you know gaps there, 49 and 69. Let, let's get in here and finish these things. Let's not do it 10 million a year where we're building a mile or two here and there. Let's get in here and build big chunks of them. Let's finish them if we can. How do we do that? So we're having those conversations. Uh, we don't have the complete answer on that yet, but we are working on that. I've already talked to some of my colleagues about ideas on how we can get those those big projects done. Okay, let me say on the front end, the, the Affordable Care Act is far from perfect, okay? We need to go in and reform it and fix it. And by the way, I've, I've, co I've sponsored and also co-sponsored some legislation. We've already passed some. And I've got more coming that I'm either the lead sponsor or one of the sponsors of. So to answer your question is, I came to the conclusion that the Affordable Care Act was the right thing for Arkansas. And I think you can look and see it's already starting to work. It is working. Look at what the state legislature did on the Medicaid expansion. Now, Arkansas was created, Arkansas credit. We did the so-called private option. But when you add that, and when you add the exchanges together, there's going to be close to 500,000. <coughs> That's one-sixth of our population of close to 500,000 Arkansans who are going to have private insurance for the first time for first time in a long time. And think about what that's going to do. The RAND study, when they studied this is whatever, six months ago, they said it's going to create 6,000 new jobs in Arkansas. People talk about job killers. You know, I just went through a list. 1,000 new jobs at Serco, 150 new jobs at Fidelity, 200 new jobs at Sykes Call Center, et cetera, 100 new jobs at Mercy Hospital. This bill isn't killing jobs. This bill's creating jobs. We got 1,000 new jobs in Rogers, Arkansas, directly because of this bill. And also, there's a, there's a there is a, a vote of conscience there as well. Look, we're the we have the best country in the world, no doubt, but we have a big problem with healthcare in this country. We have so many people that can't afford to be in the healthcare system; they just can't afford it. We did a lot of reforms. I, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story. I knew. Let me go in just a minute. Let me just tell you one little nutshell story, and you'll see, hopefully how this is going to help Arkansas. Um, I was in Conway a couple of days ago, and Conway wanted me to come visit the hospital. I couldn't do it. It was a last minute thing. They wanted me to run about it. It didn't work. But anyway, I said, why do you want me to come by? Because they said, under the Affordable Care Act, we now get kind of graded on the quality of our service, et cetera. We graded on our outcomes. And guess what? In certain areas, the Conway Hospital is top of the charts in outcomes. Okay, top of the charts. Well, they want they want to brag about that. They want to show off, which is good. Okay, so let me let me say three things about that. One, um, that means me as a as a uh, healthcare consumer, I can now have access to those grades, so to speak, and I can look out and I can say, hey, if I want to get my knee worked on. You know what? Let me look on this list. Oh, it turns out Conway Hospital does this better than anybody. I'm going to go to Conway. It, it puts information in my hand for my health care to let me make good decisions that I didn't have before. Okay, that's good for consumers. The other thing is, what it does is it will, um, it means that when the Conway Hospital gets reimbursed through, you know, the various mechanisms they get reimbursed on, guess what? They get rewarded for better outcomes. They don't get, they, as this phase is in, they're not getting paid for how many tests they run. They're not getting paid for how many days you stay in the hospital. They're going to get rewarded for how good they are and the quality of their service. Well, guess what that's going to do? That's going to make every hospital in this country improve the quality of their care. And I hate to say it, but when you talk about health care, at some point, you got to talk about money. And when you start tying their financial return to their results, they're going to have better results. And that's going to happen all over the country. So anyway, we could talk more and more about um, the Affordable Care Act, but you all know some of the stuff already. We're, we're closing the donut hole for our seniors on Medicare Part D. We're allowing people in this room to keep their kids up to age 26 on their health care coverage. Before this bill passed, before this became law, if you were a woman and you had a C-section, you could be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition. That's a pre-existing condition. You can't get health care because you have a C-section. That's not the law anymore. We changed that. Before this law passed, 
you could literally be paying health insurance premium for 20 years. 20 years. Same company. You go in there, you get diagnosed with something, they cut you off. You had no recourse. They can't do that anymore. Now with the Arkansas Insurance Exchange, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. I mean, that's still kind of a work in progress. I do know that California did theirs. The rates in California under the California Exchange were much, much lower than they expected. Now, you know, we don't know what Arkansas is going to do. But let's hope that when you have more uh, companies competing in the Arkansas market, that's good. That's good for everybody. And then you throw in the fact that um, with all the uh, tax credits that people get to go into the exchange, um, you're going to have people, individuals, small businesses, and families that absolutely were priced out of the market before that now can afford it because they get a tax credit to do it. So it's not perfect. We need to work on it. But my view is let's take the good in the law and let's build on that. And if we got things that don't work, if we got things that I know. It's causing a lot of heartburn. I had, a, by the way, one last thing on this, and I'll stop on this. I had a Republic, I had a fundraiser last night in um, in Batesville, and a guy came up to me and he said, "I'm a Republican businessman." I was like, "Uh oh, <laughs> what are you doing, my fundraiser?" <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, he said nice things about me about how I try to be the bridge builder and try to be reasonable, and that was nice, but. He said, I'm really here because of health care. And he and I talked about this like a year ago. He was pretty upset about Obamacare. He was pretty upset about it. And he came to me last night and he said, I'm still worried about what it's going to do to my costs. I'm worried about what it's going to do to my bottom line. I don't know if it's going to work. I'm worried about that. But let me tell you, he said, I'm a Republican. And I hear these Republicans now, they voted to repeal it 40 times in the House. He said, what I figured out is they're not offering any solution. They're not saying, here's how you fix it. They're just saying, repeal, repeal, repeal. You know, what they were saying a year or two ago is let's repeal and replace. And when I told my Republican colleagues in Washington, House and Senate, Republican colleagues, I said, guys, if you give me something better to vote for, I'll vote for it. You put something on paper. I'm not talking about a press conference. I'm not talking about a set of talking points. I'm talking about you put legislative language on paper, if it's better, I'll vote for it. You know what you get out of them? Crickets. You get nothing. Because they won't put it on paper. And that's why this Republican businessman came to me last night. Even though he doesn't like the law, he knows that I'm willing to listen. And I'm going to try hard to fix it. So when the business community comes to me and they say, hey, man, we don't like this, we don't like that, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. Let, let's fix it. Let's figure out how to make it better. 